Good evening. Where's my slow clap, Myra? Where's my slow clap? There it is. Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Winch. I'm a senior hub group leader here at the church. Some of you have seen me up here before. I get to deliver God's word again tonight, which I always love doing. And I'm really digging this series that we've been doing called You Lost Me. I think it's, uh, I think it's imperative that you know we, we address these topics of why are, why are youth walking away? So tonight we're tackling the area of doubt. Okay, And it's more of youth feeling that they can come with their doubt. And me personally, uh, that's kind of been like the theme of kind of like our family. Uh, my wife and I, we've always kind of worked hard with our kids of, of, of communicating, don't let your faith be my faith. Let your faith be your faith. And don't, don't believe it just because I told you. Question everything. It's, and that's kind of always been kind of the approach we've, we've taken. And I think there's freedom in doing that <clears throat> because I think— if I go to my, my kids and I say, hey, you can question everything I say. Well, I'm going to tell you what I believe is true, but you can question all of it. I think it gives them a sense of, of confidence that what I'm saying is truth because I'm willing for you to challenge it. So God is kind of in that same boat. So tonight we're, we're, we're uh, tackling doubt. So just to continue to confirm that, I'm, that, that doubt is a, is a good thing. Let me say that again. Doubt is a, is a good thing. And the reason for it is it's, it's how we grow. An example I can give you uh, to prove, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that doubt is a good thing, is Santa Claus. That guy right there. Now, what are you saying? What does Santa Claus have to do with doubt being a good thing? How many in this room, you got to be honest now, how many in this room, when you were little kids, believed that Santa Claus was real? Come on now. Pretty much every hand in this room except for my kids, because I am the worst parent ever, right? I was that dad that said, uh, Santa's for fun and Jesus is for Christmas, all right? Um, but for, this is a fact, and most, most kids, almost all kids, grow up believing that Santa is, is real, that there's this fat, jolly old elf in a red suit that climbs down your chimney around the world, delivers presents on Christmas. And you believed without a shadow of a doubt that that was truth, yes? Yes? Thank you. This is, we're going to participate, all right? But at some point as you grew and you're, you started to kind of think a little bit for yourself and starting to kind of have a little bit more of a rational way of thinking, you started to question this whole Santa thing. This seems a little bit too far-fetched to believe is truth. So how did you, how did you come to grips with that? You know, you, you asked questions. You asked other people. You did some research. Maybe you read a book and found out, oh, there is a St. Nicholas, but he was actually a guy— in, over in Holland or something like that, right, who actually did something similar to this. So it's a fable. Got it. Got it. So what happened there is your brain actually grew in that process to where you had this space in your brain that had Santa Claus's truth. And then that, that space in your brain became doubt. And as you did your own due diligence, you went and that, you replaced that doubt with truth. And in doing that, your brain grew. So that's what I'm saying. It is healthy. And I encourage you, within the church, because I have so much confidence in my God, question everything. Things you should question. Is God for real? Is the Bible for real? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? If you can answer the, those three questions, the rest is semantics. Did I say that right, honey? All right, I try to use big words, and my wife always calls me out on it, so. All right, but tonight we're going to talk about... Um, <clears throat> So let's take a look. If you have your Bibles with me, with you, I have mine with me. We're going to take a look at a quick at a passage in Matthew, Matthew 22, starting verse 26. You're going to see that God encourages you to, to question, right? Um, we're starting in 22, verse 36. So he's, he's talking in, in context. Jesus is talking with uh, the Sadducees and Pharisees. Uh, he kind of handed the Sadducees their lunch, so now the Pharisees are going to take a shot, right? So they, they try to, to, to kind of corner him. So this lawyer comes and he asks him, say, teacher, um, teacher, which is the greatest command in the law, right? And Jesus is speaking here. He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. See, Jesus encouraged you to love God with your mind. Why? He created it. <laughs> so therefore, he wants you to use it, right? 
Well, what's so interesting, if you continue reading the story, um, Jesus continues, no greater command, so on and so forth. And then he comes down into verse 41. It says, now while the Pharisees were gathering together, Jesus asked them a question. So now he's turned the tables, and he's going to challenge them and ask them a question. He says, what do you think about, uh, what do you think about the Christ? Who is he? And, and they, uh, the, the Pharisees, they answered, they said to him, uh, the son of David. Then Jesus is speaking here. He says, Then how does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then called him Lord, how can he be his son? And the Pharisees had no answer for him. So he's challenging him, wanting them to use their minds, wishing, I, I, guar- I can't guarantee, but I can imagine that Jesus was wishing those Pharisees were engaging in Scripture with their mind and truly seeking who was the Christ. Because that would have led them to Jesus. So we're going to talk about, there's three different types of doubts or that um, the young people are, are dealing with that, that kind of are the main reasons of why uh, young people are, are walking away from their faith. Um, and before I go, like I said, I want interaction and the best way I want interaction, so I, like, I throw out this word faith, and that's Christianese, right? So for those of you who are in the room who maybe don't identify yourself as a Christian, that's the lingo we use that people are like, what do you mean, faith? What's faith? So it's just another word for belief, okay? So if you hear me sh- you know, saying I have a bad habit of using Christianese, just go ahead and shout out, what does that mean? And I'll be happy to explain to you what I'm talking about, okay? So intellectual doubt is the first one that we're going to talk about. So intellectual doubt, it says 23% of 18 to 19-year-olds, 18 to 29-year-old uh, with Christian backgrounds, thanks, honey, uh, with Christian backgrounds have significant intellectual doubts about their faith. So what does that mean, intellectual doubt? So they struggle with things like, how does God allow suffering, right? Or they, they struggle with, um, isn't it fact because I was born in a Christian family, that's the only reason that I'm, I'm a Christian? Or uh, what should I, why, or what should I believe about the Bible and why, right? So those are common, like, things that, that youth struggle with. And they don't feel comfortable. The, the, the tragic part is, is they don't feel comfortable, really. The problem isn't that they have the questions like this. The problem is, is they, they're afraid to ask. These, these questions have answers. And I could go, in fact, in, in, in case you missed it, like CJ said, after we're done, Zach and I, are, we're going to stick around. Those of you who go to Hubs, go to Hubs. Those of you who want to hang out and just do some very informal Q&A, questions and answers, Zach and I, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to hang out, and you guys can throw you know, questions up here, and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, Zach's got a degree in apologetics. I think he can do a pretty good job at building some of those questions. And um, I'm no slouch myself, but I'm no Rhodes Scholar. But... Uh, but like I said, I have faith in my God that he, he, wants your, he wants your questions. So feel free to do that after we're done. So if you want to hang out, hang out with us. Uh, second reason that we have uh, young people walking through the church is called unexpressed doubt. <clears throat> and this is kind of alluding kind of what I was saying before. So 36% of 18 to 29-year-olds with Christian backgrounds said that I don't feel that I can ask my pressing questions in church. And I hope that that's not true here. Uh, so, like, again, like, like when we say church, we're talking, like, global church, big C church, the whole body. So the Christian buildings around the U.S., this is systemically what, what happens is youth don't feel that they can ask their questions um, for fear of having no faith or not being able to believe, right? Or... Um, they don't have a group like ours. Hopefully, you all in your hub groups, that's a safe place that you can ask serious questions. And let me just say this, because I, I've been a hub group leader now. Uh, the majority of the, the, you know, the young men at the table there I've been with since they were freshmen. And one thing happened dramatically around sophomore year, or into sophomore year, into junior year, is there became a level of, of deeper level of questions and and the amount of growth that I've been able to witness in these young men from junior year to senior year um, is unparalleled 
And it's simply because of the fact that they uh, admit they don't have it figured out, and they have questions, and they doubt. And, I, and, and that's what we do. We just kick them around. And if you're not doing that in your hub groups, I'm going to say this as gently as possible. You're wasting your time. All right, that's about as gentle as I can put it. If you're not asking hard, if you're, if you're not leaving your hub group leader at the end of the night scratching his head going, I don't know, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out myself, right? Then you're wasting your time. Make your faith your faith, and the only way you do that is you have to ask the questions that you have, right? Um, something I brought is kind of a, I have always not, I, I, I've had questions too, right? And so th this is just a few books out of my own personal library of things that I have done to answer my own questions or to seek information. There are so many good options out there. Um, guys like Strobel, uh, who was an atheist, who went on a pursuit to prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead and wrote one of the most epic books about, uh, about Jesus rising from the dead. Go figure right? Um, Kokel, which came and spoke, spoke with us here. C.S. Lewis. Um, there's just tons of resources. In fact, did you know that our church has a library? It's right over there, and you can check out. There, they have a whole section on apologetics. If you want to do some research, it's all there for you. Um, then the third area is, is what's called transitional doubt. 38% if young people say that they have experiences or have experienced a time they significantly doubted in their faith. So the vault, the, it was more of an emotional response, right? Um, more personal than, than intellectual. So 12% said that a death of a loved one caused them to doubt. 18% uh, say that uh, they've had a crisis that made their faith shatter or, or have some doubt. 20% uh, indicated the church doesn't help them with depression, um, which affected their journey, you know, negatively. Uh, you know, you're, like I said before, you're, you're not alone in this. Everybody, everybody struggles with doubt. Um, as, I mean, you even heard last week, was that, uh, Christine came up and, you know, as a scientist, and she's still grappling, which is awesome, you know. Um, so you're not alone. Everyone doubts, right? But God is not afraid of your doubt. King David, you guys know who he was. He was a uh, guy of Old Testament. He was the second king of Israel. Uh, he wrote the, a, a, a good portion of the Psalms, right? And in many of those Psalms, you can hear David crying out, just not understanding God or not, uh, not understanding his intentions of what's going on. You know, David ran for years uh, from 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 the current king, Saul. Uh, so he was, he, he was confused and just didn't understand of how all this up, but he, but he trusted God through it all, right? Um, there was even a disciple of Christ who doubted. In fact, he got this cool name called Doubting Thomas, right? And he's kind of known for being a doubter. So in John 20, chap uh, John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29, it says, Now Th Thomas... One of the twelve was not with the disciples uh, when Jesus came. So this is after the resurrection. Jesus is walking the earth fully alive after he'd been in the grave for three days. And he had appeared to some of the disciples, and they physically saw him. And so Thomas wasn't with them when that happened. So the other disciples told him, him being Thomas, we seen the Lord, but he, he being Thomas, said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his sides, I will not believe. Is this bad? No. He wanted proof. He wanted, he wanted concrete proof. He'd walked with Jesus intimately for three years and, and left everything behind. And he wanted to know that this was truth. So he had doubt. That God is so gracious a week later, the disciples were in the house, and Thomas was with them. Though the door was locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. 
And he said to Thomas, put your hand into my side. Or, yeah, reach out. Yeah, put your fingers here. Uh, see my hands. Reach your hand into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord, my God. Then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have belief. Who's Jesus talking about there? Anyone? He's talking about you. We don't get to physically see Jesus, right? But we gathered enough evidence to believe. And you're blessed because of it. So, and again, this goes all back into the word faith. So in Hebrews 11.1, 1, we see a description where they, they uh, where faith is described. It says, now faith is being sure of what, I'm sorry, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So it's basically believing in what you can't see because of what you can see, right? Um, to be certain of something you can't see is hard to do, right? Um, cre creation is not something that you can see, although all order of creation points to a creator, right? Um, Noah couldn't see the flood coming, but he built the ark anyway. And it hadn't even really rained in history at that point. So this was, a, 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 he believed, obviously. Um, Abraham, he was asked to sacrifice Isaac to kill his one and only son after waiting 100 years to get that son, right? He didn't know that God was going to save Isaac, but he believed that God had a plan and he trusted him. Uh, the Israelites, they didn't believe what was going to happen that the walls in Jericho were going to come tumbling down after they marched around for seven days, right? But it happened. They had a little bit more evidence because shortly before that, they had seen God open up the Jordan River so that they could walk over and get into Jericho. So they had seen God moving. <clears throat> and many of you have seen God moving. So whether you know it or not, um, you're raised in a scientific age. Science says in order to for something to be true, it has to be observed, observable, measurable, and repeatable. Observable, measurable, and repeatable. In order, or in other words, you can't prove God through science, through a sci or, or through a science experiment, right? So believing in God kind of seems to fly in the face of, of science, is what people would say. But whether or not you practice this type of faith all the time, anybody here ever been on an airplane? Flown somewhere? Before you got on the airplane, did you meet the pilot? Did you check his credentials? Did you see the logged hours of flight time that he had? Did you see the mechanic do the service check to make sure that everything was working in order? But you put your life, your faith, and belief that that plane was going to get you from point A to point B, right? Um, evolution. Does anybody have any evidence of, of macro evolution, where one species completely changes and becomes another species? In fact, I think you have a lot more faith if you believe that than that Jesus rose from the dead. So, those are just some ideas, and, and something that's been really cool about this series is every week we've brought people up here who actually have lived the life of, you've lost me, right? We've seen people up here like... Um, Jack and, and last last week with uh, Christine and some others who actually live that 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 stage in life where they walked away because you lost me, right? Uh, tonight we've searched high and low to find another, you know, qualified person out there who can maybe share the story of someone who actually fits the mold of who grew up in the church, was a regular attender, and and at some point he said you lost me, so. Uh, Please take a uh, time and let's welcome up Zach to share his story. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, uh, yeah, I love the series. Um, we've we've been able to talk through a lot uh, of looking at different people's life experiences as they've said at one point to the church or Christianity in general, uh, "You lost me," and, and have walked away. Um, 
And, and we brought up, you, you know, we brought up Jack uh, in, in week two as he talked about uh, the church being repressive and him feeling just restricted by church, the church. And we brought up Sam as she felt uh, that, that she was restricted by the church being exclusive and, and they didn't um, let, let her fit in or they didn't welcome her in. And, um, and then we brought up RT and he gave a powerful testimony several weeks ago on uh, the church being overprotective and his belief and, and him running away from God and that. And last week with Christine and just her being being vulnerable from the stage and saying, man, as a scientist, we still grapple with some of these things. And uh, tonight, um, th th this is my story a little bit uh, of a, a time where I said to the church, you lost me. I grew up um, at a small church in Paso Robles, and um, some of you have heard this story. I'm going to make it very brief, but and I'm happy to elaborate if uh, you want later. Um, but <clears throat> I grew up in this very small church. Uh, I was the model Sunday school student. I mean, I was the kid who went to Awanas. I built the little matchbox cars. Anyone else do Awanas? Uh, I built the matchbox cars. I had my little verse pack. I'd memorize all these verses. I uh, had uh, my little sports devo Bible, and I would read my sports devotional every night. And I started to begin to ask some questions right around middle school age. And I started to think through, like, man, what? Wait a second. I did the math on Noah's Ark, and I was like, how do he fit those animals on there? I don't get it. I started to think, like, wait a second, why, why doesn't the Bible talk about dinosaurs? How did Adam and Eve's kids have kids? It's an awkward answer, FYI. Uh, and, and, and I started to ask questions like this, and then when I got into high school, I started to ask my youth group leader these questions. Now, my youth group leader, like, she's a super nice lady. It wasn't her fault. She wasn't a pastor, um, but she was just some well-meaning mom. But as, as I would continue to ask these questions and questions, she was volunteering at this youth group, this poor lady, and I would ask these really difficult questions. And at one point, she got so flustered, she was like, you don't have enough faith. You just need to believe harder and pray a little more, and then you'll figure it out. And so this is what the, she, she told me, just straight up. You just need to believe a little harder, pray a little more, and you'll figure it out. And that's just not what the Bible teaches. Although at the time I was so flustered and frustrated, I was like, that's stupid. And I still began to ask these questions. But while I was asking questions, I was sitting in this pool of cynicism and just letting my heart get really bitter towards God. Around the same time, uh, a, a thing happened to a family friend that was tragic, and, and a, a person I knew at the high school that I went to committed suicide, and there was just all these, these things around me where I was like, I don't understand how God can be real, or God could be good, and allow these things to happen. And as I would ask these questions, I would just get, ah, you didn't believe enough. And so I said, you lost me. I was like, maybe there's a God, but I don't want to follow that God right now, and I don't have all the answers, and I don't want— no, no one's showing me how to get there. And so I lived a period of my life for about a year and a half where I went to church every Sunday and I didn't believe a word of it. I saw in sermon after sermon after sermon, rolling my eyes. I looked around in worship and people were raising their hand and I looked around and like, you fakers. You're just a bunch of hypocrites. You just use Christianity as a crutch. All you want to do is just, you just believe in Jesus because you want some hope for when you die. What a lame way to live. And I was convinced in my mind that the second I turned 18 and I got out of my parents' house, I was walking away from the church for good. In senior year, I had this, this near the end of my senior year, I had a friend in high school, the, the only Christian friend I had. I had a big circle of non-believing friends in, at Paso High. And the only Christian friend I had, she was like, hey, you want to go to church? To a different church. It happened to be Tascadero Bible Church. And uh, I said, Ugh, I don't know, man. I've done that. I've been that road. I've been going to church for 15 years. I don't, I don't need to go right now. And uh, so, so I said no. I said no, and I said no. And then finally I went to church on a Sunday. And something inside me, I, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was God. Maybe it was just, just me. I, I don't know. I, I can't just um, prove to you that it was God. But in my mind, it was God just kind of pulling me to this, saying like, man, I, just give it a chance. And so I did. Uh, I, I gave it an honest chance. I, I sat through some church services, still had a really hard time believing it, went to college at Long Beach State. And my first week at Long Beach State, I'm walking around, and I see this group called the Navigators. Uh, it's a Christian organization at Long Beach, similar to Campus Crusade or something like that at a college university. And um, the guy who discipled me for, ended up discipling me for four years at Long Beach, uh, Don, was standing there, 
and he approached me on day one of college and just was like, hey, what's up, man? How are you? You know, and just it, for stroke up, uh, struck up a conversation with me. And as, as we're talking, he began to just share his faith a little bit with me. And I see some genuine faith in a guy who really, he didn't have all the answers, but he was willing to engage in the hard questions. And that was different. That was new to me. And so I began to pursue God. And, and as I did, I didn't have some earth shattering moment. I mean, I've had moments where I've gone like, I feel God. But then the next day I'm like, well, maybe that was a bad piece of pizza. Or maybe the worship music was just really good that night. Or maybe the fog machine brought the Holy Spirit into this place. You know, the fog rolls and the Holy Spirit moves. Maybe the set design just really moved me emotionally. And so, so I, I stopped basing it on my feelings. Like I just, oh, I don't feel God, so I'm not following Jesus. And I started basing it on what does reality say? And reality actually says and leads to the belief that there is a God. And so I, I have wrestled with doubts and have come out the other side. And, and as I wrestled with these doubts and I walked away from the church and given up on my faith and then eventually came back, I began, uh, once I graduated from college, um, I, I ran a basketball league for years here at ABC Church and I've coached basketball for years. Uh, and, and I was a hub group leader here for middle schoolers. And I've been a, a hub group leader uh, for eight years. Um, and, and in that time as a hub group leader, I've watched uh, kid after kid walk away uh, for, for lack of evidence when the evidence is there. And so I began to just get so disheartened by it. I would see, um, and when I would teach at the middle school, I would see some of you in class trying to have honest discussions about faith and just being bullied by your classmates and put down and, and being told that you were an idiot. And as a, as a Christian teacher in a public school, I couldn't come to your defense. I mean, I could tell people to stop telling you to be an idiot. But uh, I couldn't, like, defend your faith with you. So, so what I did is I got a degree in Christian apologetics, um, a master's degree through Biola University and, uh, while I was teaching. And, and it was just for me to be able to help young people wrestle with their doubts and wrestle with the things that they really didn't know and couldn't understand. And so, um, and also it was for me, quite honestly, because there's still times in my life where I read a verse in the Old Testament. I read a verse in the Old Testament two weeks ago. I was like, that sucks. Like, I, I, has anyone ever done that? You've read your Bible and you look through it and you're like, I hate that verse. There's plenty of times I do that. And there's plenty of times when I look at it and I go, man, that's some tension. And that's okay. It's okay to doubt and okay to wrestle with tension. So I'm going to close uh, in just a minute because I do want to either allow you some good time in your hub groups with your hub group leader, or if you want to stay back, ask questions, even anonymously, if you want to write them down. Steve's going to come around and pick up the cards in just a minute. So feel free to ask an anonymous question um, that you've always been wondering about God or you've never been able to answer. And I can't promise I'll answer it, but I'll try. And, uh, and, and do the best I can with that. But I want to leave you with just a, a, a couple quick things. And Jeff talked about this a little bit, so I'm not going to go over it too much. But big thing, we, we talked about the church's fault over this series and the individual's fault. All right, and so here's where the church is at fault. Um, and sometimes th there's the expert in the church. Uh, and, and I guess in this situation, I, I don't like being thought of as an expert, and I don't think I'm really an expert in things, but because I have this degree, some of the people will look at me and they'll go like, oh, that's an expert in defending the faith. Um, and then if the expert in the church sometimes can make students or, or whoever they're interacting with feel stupid, like they'll come across super smug, or they'll come across as arrogant, or they'll say like, ah, you just don't have enough faith, or whatever, just believe harder, or whatever, I'm the pastor, eh, it's dumb. Uh, and, and, and I just don't operate that way. And if I have, if you've ever felt that way, I'm really sorry. Like, I, I truly am. I, I don't want you to ever feel that we are uh, patronizing you or that we think less of you if you struggle with doubt or that you don't believe. Um, in fact, we think more of you. We think more of you when you come forward and, 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 um, and, and say you struggle with things. There's some of you in this room who don't believe in God uh, at all. I don't think you understand how much respect I have for you to be in a place like this. I, I would have never, ever, in a million years, have come to a church if I didn't believe in Jesus growing up. Like, like if I just lived my life and I didn't have the, I could have the option to not come, man, I applaud you for being in this room. And you should be celebrated. The fact that you're here and you don't believe in God and you're still willing to come and intellectually and emotionally engage in something you don't believe in, that speaks volumes about who you are, and you should be celebrated for that. And, uh, and so, so we as a church, we need to do a better job of creating a culture where you can ask questions. 
Uh, but at the same time, we need to also not be a, a place that chokes out hope with cynicism. Sometimes we can celebrate doubts a little too much almost. We're like, yes, keep doubting, keep doubting. And, wh- and what happens if we don't help you move forward with your doubt, you'll sit there and you'll just be cynical about it. And then doubt leads to apathy and apathy to inaction. And so this is a quote by Daniel Taylor I want to share it with you. He says, I have learned to live with the rise and fall of the thoughts and the feelings of faith, to coexist with honest doubt, to accept tension and paradox without clinging to it as an excuse for inaction. If you're struggling with doubt, one of the best things you can do is start serving. It, it, it start following Jesus. You know, Jesus went to his disciples, and he didn't say, let me give you the 55 proofs for my resurrection. He said, follow me. And the disciples didn't know who he was. They didn't see all the miracles. They just, in an act of obedience, started following him. And from that, faith grew. And if, so if you're struggling with your faith, I'd start following Jesus a little more, man. I'd start obeying and just seeing where that act of obedience might lead you in your struggle for your faith. And the three things I would do with our doubts. The first is to have a cr- good Christian community. Talk to your hub leader. Talk to your solid Christian friends. Man, don't isolate yourself. Don't do what I did. Don't sit in a pew for two straight years hating every word that came out of a preacher's mouth and rolling my eyes when my parents would pray at night. Don't do it. Just don't isolate yourselves. Satan, the enemy, is that he wants you to think that you are the only person in this room struggling, and you're not. There are so many of you that are struggling with doubt in this room, and there are so many people at your school that are struggling with doubt, and you're in your community. So don't isolate yourselves. The second thing is to admit that you doubt. When you doubt, admit it. Come talk to your hub group leader. Um, I I think you guys don't understand how often, you know, your hub group leaders are so underutilized here. There is such a wealth of wisdom and experience and knowledge in this room. And and this isn't just like a, a, oh, I'm going to brag about our hub leaders, although it is. I mean, I I love our hub leaders. But I think you guys just don't understand sometimes. There's such a wealth of knowledge. There's a wealth of knowledge among the the peers in this room. And sometimes we don't lean into our friends and hub leaders and and hub time. And Jeff kind of talked about that, so I won't won't go on on that. But I, I would encourage you to admit that you doubt and use your hub group leaders for support and advice and strength. And do not waste your time. There's a story I I love. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Um, It's out of Mark 9. There's this guy who brings his son to Jesus, and his son had been demon-possessed. And his son was having convulsions and freaking out the whole time. And and, um, and, and Jesus says, yeah, what, what do you want from me? And the man says, well, I'd love for my son to be healed if you can. And Jesus says, if I can. He's like, all things are possible for he who believes. And this man says what, what to me is the cry of my heart on a semi-regular basis. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. There are so many things about God that I love. There, there are truths about God that I absolutely know are true. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and I'm as sure of that as I'm sure of any fact or statistic in my life. And there's so much historical evidence to back it up. It's not even funny. I am sure that there is good and there is evil in this world. And because I'm sure that there's good and evil in this world, I am sure that there's a God who dictates what good and evil is. And I'm more sure of that than anything in my life. But there are parts of this world and parts of the Bible that I still will once in a while come across and be like, oh, I'm struggling with that. And this has been the, my prayer. If I ever see something or hear something that makes me doubt, I go, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And then I go to people I trust and I say, man, I'm struggling with this. Talk me through it. Give me some wisdom. Help me see it a different way. And the third one is to look for the answers. Uh, look for the answers. Seek truth. Read a book like the one that, that Jeff talked about, or I could point you to a ton of other resources too. Uh, read the Bible. Um, and, and as Jeff said, doubt is healthy and it, it's good if we take that doubt and we move it towards truth. If you are doubting and seeking truth, then you're going to find it. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he meant it. So we seek him, and we're going to find that truth. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then uh, you guys are free to go to hubs. Um, 
or if you want to stay back, uh, Jeff and I are just going to be casually answering questions as long as you want. Um, and remember that um, uh, HSME tickets are sold at the Barnwood booth afterwards tonight, as well as uh, HSME talent show. And unless you want to see me do interpretive dance for the whole night, you might want to sign up for a talent. So you'll talk to Josh McEwen uh, about that afterwards. Um, and just a, one more quick thing on, on the, the question and answer. Um, on the question and answer, this isn't like a, once you stay, you're stuck, you know? Like we've captured you for 40 minutes. Man, if you, if you just wanna be in here, you wanna ask one question and you wanna bounce the hubs or you wanna drive away, go home. I mean, we're not, we're not babysitting you. I mean, you guys are, you're young adults. And so um, come and go uh, and, and, and feel like you have the freedom to do that. We just wanna make this a place where you can really express those doubts and concerns. And so let's pray together. God, uh, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for the amazing young men and women that are in this room. Um, people who've chosen to follow you and, and people who haven't. God, I'm so thankful for all of them. I'm thankful for the, the questions that are in this room right now. God, we know that you welcome doubt and, and you really do want us to wrestle with truth. And God, as you have said, love you with our minds. God, tonight, would we be able to do that? In a real and authentic way, would we be able to break barriers down and be able to admit to each other that we're struggling with what we're struggling with? God, we love you and we thank you in your name. Amen. Have a great night, guys. If you want to stay back to ask some questions, we'll be here. We'll start in a couple minutes.